All right, what I'd like to cover with you today are 20 time hacks on how to run your investment company or family office faster, get more done every day. And we've learned a lot of these over the last 16 years. Some of them have taken from interacting with you as members. Obviously, you're different than myself in terms of business model, probably. So some of these are going to apply, some not. But that's why I wanted to pro provide more than just one or two of them. So this is one of the most important ones. So I put it first. And it's uh, the foundation for everything else. All of you probably know a lot of things you need to do, but then other things get in the way. And maybe something that's urgent gets in the way of doing what is really important. And so every morning, um, I read this. I travel with it. It's in my bag right over there. I just brought it out in my last meeting with my friend Keith this morning. And I have on here my monthly goals, my quarterly goals, my annual goals. And that big fat paragraph at the end are little one-liner statements. If I read an amazing book from billionaire Steve Schwarzman, and I get one key idea from the book that summarizes the whole book and reminds me of his type of thinking then I'll put that on there. Or one of the quotes I read every morning on there is that Bruce Lee said that calm is a superpower. Or don't focus on anything linear, only exponential. Or don't go to any meetings I don't want to go to. Or don't work on anything that's not exciting. So I have 40 of those operating statements on here. And by every day, starting my day, reading my monthly, quarterly, annual goals and these 40 operating statements, I go out in the world and I know what I'm looking for. I know what I'm trying to get done. I know who's, who to say no to. I know uh, things that I should be working on proactively. This helps me save the most time because it allows me to say no to things more quickly. Um, it allows me just to make more progress. So this costs nothing. It's not, it's not a service we offer. You can just put this together in a Word document. Uh, I, up, I update mine uh, monthly, laminate it, and every morning when I'm shaving, I'm looking at this. Next idea is to figure out where you can buy time. Um, it's easier in some ways to do everything yourself to make sure it's done exactly right, but then you'll never grow. You need to delegate, find people who are actually better than you at doing certain things and realize in some areas, until somebody gets fully trained, they may not be as good at you doing it, but you doing that thing, it's more costly. It's okay maybe that some things are done at 80, 90% of the quality you would have done it at, but now you're freed up from those things. So you have to figure out how much your time is worth and just realize that Okay, well, if one Uber is going to show up 12 minutes before the other one, and that means you can work an extra 12 minutes at the airport, just pay the extra 20 bucks for the Uber XL or the Uber Black, even if it's just you, because just your time is worth it. Not to mention you're less likely to die in a fiery blaze in an Uber Black than some Uber X that's like a Honda, Honda Civic or something, right? So something to keep in mind. Um, you burn money when you're cheap on buying more time. So you just have to figure out that value for yourself. A lot of you probably should be flying first class some of the time or all the time. You get to board earlier, get extra work done or relax when you're on there, um, have a more enjoyable uh, trip, probably way more productive with an actual little desk to work on in first class versus trying to work like this. I'm not a big guy, but I feel like it in coach. So as some of you scale, you have to consider that just in the last 30 days, I met someone who works uh, for Warren Buffett buying auto dealerships. They own 79 auto dealerships in the Berkshire Hathaway um, auto division by sitting in first class. I met an investor who's having a $28 million exit this month um, and made friends with him. I also met while flying to Nepal um, a billionaire family member, the family who owned the UFC group before selling it. Um, happens to be Brazilian. My wife happens to be Brazilian. We chatted along the way, and she also knew uh, Nims Day from the 14 Peaks. That's how we got to meet him and go to his uh, camp at base camp, and that wouldn't have happened unless by chance, you know, uh, that time we were just upgraded to business class. So you can be more productive, and it's just more, more worthwhile. Um, there might be multiple benefits from doing that uh, while traveling. Next one is to make sure you have a great executive assistant. Um, we have a separate executive assistant full-time just focused on billionaires.com. And our full-time job is to reach out to billionaires, figure out how to have them speak at our events, how to interview them for the website. Um, and it just helps us make more progress on that project. But also um, my assistant stays 100% busy helping me keep on top of my, in my inbox. And when I work with people who are scaling and wanting to set up a family office, a lot of them are missing a high power executive assistant. They might have one, they're paying $40,000 a year, 
But when you invest more in having a great assistant and someone to support you, you're actually investing in yourself because then they're more capable and you freed up yourself from regulatory paperwork, following up with bills, helping prep taxes or, or investor administration related uh, things. Um, saying no in a way that you're comfortable with is hard for a lot of us. We feel almost guilty saying no to things. We have to get better and better at that as more things come at you. So the statements that work for you will be different than for me. Um, but saying things like, oh, I'm already overcommitted at this point, or I am traveling that week. Um, I have too much on my calendar here or there. And just getting better at saying no all the time is really important as a family office. Um, because there's not enough time in the day to say yes to all the things that you would like to. Um, there's, there's two types of pain, um, short term and long term. That's what Dan Sullivan taught me. So you can choose to have long term pain if you take a while to say no, if you take a while to remove someone from your team that's not a good fit, or you can just move swiftly when you know something is not a fit. It's not aligned. It's not a great partner. Um, doesn't feel right working with the person. So figure out what's frustrating you, what's taking all of your energy, and just clear that off your plate as an investor or as an investment company. Um, you know, Dan Kennedy had a rule. He said that um, if I'm not married to you and I, I wake up more than three times in the morning thinking about you, then you're fired. Like if he's, he's uh, if he doesn't want you taking that much of his brain, um, that's the, the polite way to say it on stage, basically. Um, I interviewed Tony Robbins recently, thanks to Harry Clore here in the room. And um, what's interesting is Tony said that he worked harder in the interview when he ran a company doing 10 million a year in revenue than he works now. And now he has 110 companies doing $7 billion in revenue because he was in operator mode, not in owner mode. If you want to listen to all of his insights, he talks about the power of proximity. You can listen to this interview at billionaires.com for free. And there's different levels of owner mode. When you talk about saving time, it's changing your mindset and where you spend your energy. So operator mode, like we work a lot of doctors and dentists, for example. So just to take that as an example, when you first start out as a dentist, you're probably working for somebody else as a W-2 dentist. Then eventually you might start your own practice, but really you bought yourself a job. After that, you might try to only practice two days a month, four days a month, and your team is executing on things. Um, and then after that, you might be investor and owner and not practicing at all, but evolving how much you are the owner of your business and not the operator turning the crank all day is important for all of us, whether you're developing cell storage or running a stem cell company, et cetera. We've used Upwork.com. We've spent almost a million dollars on Upwork. We've hired over 100 professionals on here. These are everything from programmers to virtual assistants to different niche experts on things like financial modeling, um, researching and creating a database of dermatology clinics we want to invest into, et cetera. Um, so I'd encourage you to check it out. We only hire typically Americans and Filipinos on there. We're very explicit about the projects. We check the first couple hours or half day of work, then every couple days of work, then we have someone couple checking in with them a couple days a week. We have several full-time people that work for us in the Philippines through Upwork.com. So I would check that out to save yourself time and execute on what we talk about at our workshops by using talent from, this, from Upwork. We also use Gmail shortcuts and auto forwards. We use the snooze function in Gmail to get more done. And we relentlessly follow up on deals that we're trying to structure. Like I mentioned yesterday on stage, by when we push send on an email, we snooze it for when we want it to have it pop back up so we don't have to remember, oh, I should follow up in six days or six weeks if they never reply to me. But then it automatically comes back in your inbox. You see that you sent an email they didn't reply to and you can get back to them. We use a plugin called MailTrack. Um, and that helps us. We use a plugin uh, program called LastPass to save all our passwords. It just helps us move faster. Some of these are very simple ideas, but if it can save you hours per year or an hour a month or help you with getting more deals done, it could be a huge time saver. I mentioned yesterday on stage Check Checker, uh, which is a one hour background check service. For those of you who don't want to do a big spend on extensive due diligence on someone, you might want a really basic background check. So you can ask some smart questions while vetting them as an investor or a partner. This is the service we just mentioned. We also use VCheck, which is mentioned here. It's about $1,700 for a background check with them. Uh, we've been using ghostwrite.ai. We've tried a lot of chat GPT AI programs for Gmail. Um, and this is the best one we have found, uh, ghostwrite.ai. Um, email is how we get a lot done in our business. Um, and it says you can write emails five times faster is their pitch. I type pretty quickly, like a lot of you. So I don't know if it 
writes it five times faster, but I'll write a little two and a half sentences, put it into ghostwrite.ai, and it'll write two and a half paragraphs that sound a lot nicer than what I wrote. And it's just more elegant and sounds very well explained and more well written. Um, so for me, it's just in the same amount of time, I can write something that sounds a lot nicer. For some of you, if you're slow at typing, I'm sure it could help you getting things done five times faster. Um, I've also tested out um, writing a romantic note to my wife, and that seemed to work. I don't think she knew it was from AI, so you could use it for that to save yourself time for Mother's Day or whatever coming up. Um, but that's, that's the number one. Also, if you're into AI stuff, there's a website called there's an AI for that.com. And it's an AI that tracks all of the AI programs out there. So there's over 3000 AI tools for email, for due diligence, for code checking, whatever it is that you're in or need to look at. So check out there's an AI for that.com if you can. For me, Extra phone calls and Zooms are just the death of time. It just takes too much time. There's too much coming in to be on the phone for 40 minutes here, one hour there. Before you know it, the whole day is done. So this is a probably the most important slide for me and some people here in the room that have a lot coming at them, like Michael talked about from the billion dollar plus single family office yesterday uh, on stage. Um, ask for materials before you get on the call for a pitch. If somebody says they can only pitch you the idea over the phone, they can't put it in writing, then just pass on it. Um, try to look at a one pager before you look at a pitch deck. Make sure that there's an agenda for the phone call before you get on the phone. Um, people who are really busy don't want to get on the phone just to trade ideas or um, just to pick their brain, right? They need to have something a little bit concrete to know what's going on, what's expected, what's being discussed, etc. In Grant Cardone's recent book, 10X Mentor, which is a really great book, he talks about how he schedules out his calls to be five minutes. And he tells people when he starts a conversation, all right, we have five minutes. And some people get really taken aback, like, oh, what? I thought we had 30 minutes. Like, no, you have five. Go. Now you have four and a half. And he says he's ruthless about it, but he's enthusiastic and positive at the same time. He's not being a jerk or mean about it, but his time is super valuable. And if it needs to go beyond five minutes, it can. But it, it, most conversations don't need to be more than that. And some of the most valuable phone calls I have are seven to 12 minutes long, I've noticed, seven to eight minutes long. And a lot of things people want to talk about can be solved via email. It's just getting the ideas from my brain to your brain. It's not the meat of the issue. The phone call should just be about the meat of the issue. As simple as that sounds, 95% of people don't communicate that way um, and are very time intensive on the phone and Zoom. Um, getting up early, working hard. Michael Jordan showed up the day after winning the NBA championship. And one of the players, he showed up at 5 a.m. One of the players showed up at 6 a.m. And one of the younger rookie players said, what are you doing here, Michael? Uh, and he said, well, the better question is, where were you an hour ago? Um, because he was already at the top of his game. For me, um, I don't get up early to exercise. In the morning, I need a fresh brain to get a lot done before I start being pinged by a lot of things. And so my brain can be tired and I can exercise in the afternoon. For me, that's the template that works best to save time, get more done, get all the emails killed off early in the day, and just identify three big goals to get done each day and scripting out my schedule and starting with the one pager uh, that I talked about at the start. Another rule is to only work on exciting projects. You want to do stuff faster when you're working on something exciting. It's more motivating. Other people want to help you more because they might find it exciting. For me, that might be medical clinic capital or billionaires.com or doing research on the, the ultra healthy idea or working on our short term rental area. So again, go back to what's not exciting, what's annoying, what's frustrating have someone else on your team do it, delegate it or kill that project or figure out how to sell it off and get it off your plate because it's sucking your energy. What I found with, with billionaires, somebody asked me yesterday, what's the biggest insight you've had from studying all these billionaires? One of the top three insights is that if you're a billionaire, you don't have to work on a business model that doesn't make much money. You probably have several business models, so you can work on the ones that make more money. You don't have to work with a bad quality partner. You don't have to work with bad quality employees. And you know yourself well enough if you're already wealthy to focus your energy on what you're best at and what you're passionate at and what your skill set gives you a big edge on. And then when you stack all those advantages, every hour of time you put in gives you a huge result compared to other people who maybe don't have a good team, don't have good partners, have a business model that doesn't produce profits or isn't scalable, and they maybe don't know themselves well enough. When you stack all of that, then you just produce a ton of value, it seems, compared to other people, uh, all else equal. And when I'm flying first class, I notice I'm always the only one working, sometimes one other person. 
And we talk about it at our workshops. You need to find somebody you're passionate about, fits your DNA, and can make you a lot of money. And then you'll run circles around other people that rather just drool at their Hulu while traveling, and that's fine. They just, everyone should be relaxing sometimes in their life. But you have to ask yourself, is Hulu more exciting than what you're working on in your business? Then maybe you should have some different projects where sometimes it's more exciting to work on something extra for the business than stare at a streaming device or a, a playoff game in the NBA. Just two slides left here. Um, billionaire time rules. A lot of billionaires have a high expectation of excellence within their team. And expecting that a lot gets things moving faster over time and sets a culture for your team. If you have someone on your team that's not excellent, the immune system of your culture will expel them over time naturally. Um, and then you may need to speed that process up if you see that train coming down the line. Um, and so a lot of billionaires, if you don't communicate their way, they'll just disconnect and not communicate because they're moving fast and they're not gonna stop and change their mode to say, oh, you prefer 90 minute phone calls? Okay, we'll have a 90 minute phone call. You know, if their template is five minute phone calls, then that's the way they're gonna communicate. And they say no to almost everything. Almost all of them wake up very early. Almost all of them work smart and work hard, not just work smart. Um, so those are some of the things that we've noticed along the way. A lot of them face the hard truths and do what is needed. And they're ruthless with their prioritization. So how many people in here have read more than 10 books from a billionaire uh, in their life? So we have good eight or nine, maybe 10 people. Um, so I would encourage everyone to take a picture of this slide. These are some of the uh, best books I know have written by billionaires. We actually have the co-author of Life Force. Uh, Robert Herrera is going to be speaking today at around 11 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. And he's actually one of our keynote speakers for today. So we're excited to have him here with us. But if you haven't read these books, I would definitely check them out. Shut Up and Listen by Tillman Furtada is great. 10X Mentor is great. My favorite billionaire book is the Steve Schwartzman book, What It Takes. Uh, if you haven't read that book, you have to read it. I've read it twice now in the past year, and it's amazing. So hope you can check these out. And I would just encourage you maybe to not read books by non-billionaires until you've read a bunch of billionaire books. Because um, they might just be good at marketing their book and not as good at business as these people are. So we don't have time to do a small group exercise like we do at our mastermind events and our workshops, but I encourage you to think, what are five time hacks you could implement right now and maybe be writing these down? What monthly goals need to be on your one pager? What quarterly goals? And what are some components to that operating system at the bottom of my one pager that you could be writing down and implementing? Because I think if you take action on what's on this slide, then you'll save yourself a lot of time, be more effective, get more done every day. And I just wanted to share some of those ideas with you here today.